hope it's uh, it's two o'clock, my dude. That's what they tell me. Yeah. Is there a presentation that we had like we're thinking about? I was just gonna hang out for an hour. Yeah. Kind of chill. It's been a busy weekend. No, I understand. <laughs> Hi, everybody. There's a lot of people here that have decided to come hang out. With yeah, it's pretty cool. For no reason. So, uh, I guess we're here to talk about ancestor veneration. I'm Ocean Keltoy. This is Wolf the Red. Yo. Um, what do you do, Wolf the Red? So, uh, I'm a heathen. I'm a heathen YouTuber. Got about 10,000 subs on YouTube. I specialize in covering the Havamal, breaking down several different translations, and uh, giving my own interpretations of those translations, making the sources extremely accessible for people who may have trouble reading or may have trouble uh, discerning the poetic language of people who have translated the Havamal. Um, I also cover a lot of talks on ancestor veneration. I cover a lot of like bigotry and dog whistle content, making sure people can understand what it is they're looking at when someone may be trying to infiltrate or uh, spread harmful spread rhetoric. Spread harmful yeah. rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a big anti-racist, big anti-folkist. It's what a lot of my content and activism surrounds, and so that's what my channel does. And then I also cover like a few concepts historically about heathenry, trying to stop the spread of misinformation, like advocating for self-harm and stuff like that. I see that a lot, so um, I try to fight back against that. Ocean, what do you do? Um, YouTuber as well. What? Um, yeah, I just started. Um, oh, okay. So, uh, got a channel where I do a lot of like introductory to uh, heathenry content, um, beauty profiles, um, and you know, covering a, a lately I've been di I've been diving into polytheist philosophy, and uh, we can kind of dive into a little bit of that here with ancestor veneration because a lot of the question about ancestors and their relationship with divinity is like one of the big things that comes up uh, when talking about ancestor worship what is worship relation to that right so because uh, a lot of people understand worship it's like that's something that's reserved for deities only and if you're worshiping something that's not a deity well that makes it a deity or you think it's a deity or something along those so lines. you're elevating it above its station right. or whatever yeah yeah something along those lines so um but uh yeah we'll dive in a little bit mm -hmm. into that so yeah what is unique about both you and i and our even paths well we're both is it unique to be Reconstructionist, both of us? I think that... I think that that's a dying breed lately. I don't know. No. I could be it's wrong not, about that. Not I don't so much know. in the heathen community. I yeah. could be wrong about that. I find it in the heathen community, it's fairly common. But I do find also a lot of stuffiness among Reconstructionists in the heathen they community. They've definitely earned so. uh, a bad reputation. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, I guess there's... Uh, let's, go, let's just kind of define like what Reconstructionism is. Briefly, we talked about this in the uh, the hell panel for a lot of uh, got a lot of y'all that showed up for that one. Um, but recons are basically people that feel pulled to a particular tradition. They're looking to the past to imitate those traditions. That uh, so essentially, people in the past had connections with the gods. We feel pulled to the same tradition that they had in the past. So the solution is, oh, well, let's just imitate what they were doing in order to foster our spirituality and have a spiritual exploration. We have to figure out what it was they were doing. We have to read a whole lot of different things to figure that out, not right. just the sources relating to the spirituality, but you have to dive into history, archaeology, archaeology, anthropology. You have to dive into all of that to be able so to much information properly about rebuild burials and funerals. Accurately. <laughs> it is that they were doing and that's why I say that I do feel like recons are dying out because there are a lot of people who say that they're recons and then they do stuff that's not really recon and that's fine yeah but recon means something so I think that uh, one of the things that kind of pops up with recon um, there's a latent Christian part of recon I think that where people uh, that are recon will look at the, the past and say, well, that's the right way. Right. When in the past, there's several ways. There's a myriad so, of different ways that they did it in the past. There's also options for several different ways of justifying what Correct. you're doing in the present. There's multiple ways of being recon. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, 
I guess we should talk about revivalism at the same time. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so there's Reconstructionism, and then also there's another uh, path called revivalism. But you can be both at the same time. But revivalism involves basically adapting the religion from the past into the context of modern society. And I think that anybody who's like seriously reconstructing is going to also be doing some revivalism. Yeah, a good recon is adopting is also a revivalism. modern tradition. So, because uh, if you're just doing reconstruction and you're not adopting, you're not filling in any of the gaps or anything like that, there's not really enough at least for heathenry, available in history to have a complete practice. Right. Because a lot of the information has been lost, it's been hidden in time, it's been modified or changed somewhat by uh, Christian records. We don't know whether or not they were completely honest in the context that they built those uh, explaining of traditions. So, um, yeah, and that's something that's unique to heathenry. I think that within some other traditions, you might be able to build something a little bit more complete, like if you're doing Roman reconstruction or Greek reconstruction or something like that, more records. But I mean, the hardest part, especially for heathenry, uh, all like Anglo-Saxon, Baltic, Slavic, Norse, those traditions died out. They're not, they didn't survive through <coughs> all of the things that kind of pushed it down. So it is hard. Is there any Anglo-Saxon heathens in the audience here? I know there's one. Hey. Um, Anglo-Saxon there's heathens. There's always one. There's always one. <laughs> <laughs> Can never escape. Anglo-Saxon heathenry has got a really good example, which is like leech books. Yeah. So, leech books are um, basically Christian magic texts, and in them there's a lot of rituals that have God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and all this stuff, and they're they're incantations to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. But it seems like they're just pagan rituals in which the names of the gods or ancestors or whatever were changed to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. In whatever the case, and it seems to be it seems to have been done inconsistently, um, but it's just one of the things the challenges that you have as a recon is you're going to be looking to the past for this information, and it's like, oh look, there's this potentially useful text. Oh God, now I have to decode it and figure out like what's what am I trying to reconstruct here? And um, so the Christian sources that are out there can be extremely valuable while also very frustrating at the yeah. same time, right? <laughs> so, um, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, and within heathenry, what is heathenry? Well, is there, are, are specific? I have a very specific uh, definition that I give, and it's pre-Christian, pan-Germanic faith of the folk peoples who practiced in that time. And that's, when somebody asks me, well, what is heathenry? That's the label that I give. It's a very specific label. I usually just go polytheistic Germanic tradition. Right. So, um, and, but both of those definitions kind of work. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but with that, it's extremely broad. Right. Um, it's a broad time period and geographical location. It's right. not just like, oh, it's not just the Norse and Scandinavia. It is a lot. It covers a lot of ground. So heathenry is a tradition that's covering geographically, Scandinavia, parts of Britain at certain historical mm -hmm. times, Iceland, uh, then there's continental Europe, uh, you've got, um, there's the migration era in which that, that tradition expanded downward into Italy and Spain, uh, and uh, what the, at the time was called Gaul, but is modern day France. So uh, there's a lot of areas in which to find various traditions and all that kind of stuff in order to try and pull from different stories. Um, so What's an important aspect of heathenry, Ocean? Are you talking about the polytheism part? Or are you talking about the or are you talking about the ancestor veneration part? Are we doing the are we referencing the panel here or are we just talking about I don't know. I'm gonna make see, here we go. <laughs> is that like part of being in charge of the panel is that you're the one who gets to face palm? Yes. Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I could I'm here to make your life a little frustrating. That's kind of what Hey buddy. Yeah? You've been doing that really well for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Achievement unlocked. <laughs> he, 
I think once you unlock it, you don't have to keep doing it. No, no, I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, cool. It's a repeat trophy. You don't man. want it to. I always hate seeing that little way. thing pop up in the corner of the screen. It's, it's just a constant blip noise. Yeah, great. <laughs> Love it. Love that. For me. <laughs> What's an important part of heathenry, Wolf? Ancestor veneration, Ocean. Oh, good. Isn't that neat? <laughs> Is there a panel on that at this event? Uh, if there is, we should probably go to it. We should probably it's something I'm very out. interested in. Okay, so we've got I've got a list uh, here about some historical moments of ancestor veneration. Is there one that you want to tackle there on that list? Or do you want me to jump into it? Are you the history in? guy. Okay, I'm the history. Yeah. All right, I'll do the history guy thing. Nail it. So. Uh, in the saga of England, some story, uh, Snorri Sturluson, you had Freyr as one of the first kings of uh, Sweden. So in Snorri's history of the kings of Norway, he starts logically with the kings of Sweden, um, for whatever reason. I'm still unclear of exactly why he chose that. But um, it results in Freyr establishing a temple at Uppsala uh, and then conducting rituals there. Kind of showing everybody how to do ritual then he promptly <coughs> dies uh, but does not stop ruling sweden um, he just kind of chills uh ruling as a deceased body from the grave for a period of time um the chat. yeah they <laughs> they're just like hey uh he's dead but we don't really want to tell anybody he's dead so he was considered uh in the heims kringla um which is Damn it, I'm gonna have to do all this, aren't I? Heims Kringla does what is called a euhemerist retelling of the story of the gods, which is that he takes the gods, turns them into humans, and then tells that story in that way. And we get this story of Freyr being the first king of Sweden. So they're mortal beings walking around with us, interacting with other humans, having human attributes that they probably wouldn't have normally. It's very interesting language used to describe what should be probably significantly more complicated right. deities and interactions. So whether or not the people of the time believed Freyr was, as a human at some point, the king of Sweden, we don't know. We don't really know. But Snorri writes this down. And right. Snorri had motivations. There's there's questions about whether or not even the his sagas of the various kings are actually reflected as historical narratives. But... Uh, in this story that we have, he talks about Freyr being uh, one of the first kings and ruling from the grave. Now, whether or not this is something that they believed at that time, you do get some hints of like what were the associations of these deities at the time. So Freyr winds up being a god that is associated with kingship, a god that is associated with uh, fertility, plentifulness, uh, wealth. Um, because of the Grand Temple of, at Uppsala, the um, plentiful food that was around when he was king, and so on. Saxo Grammaticus also has King Frothi, who is very similar to this, also dies and rules from the grave. There was probably a story here somewhere where something like this happened, because we see Snorri talking about it in one place and Saxo talking about it in a completely different place. Yep. So, um, And they're both referencing, like, this happened while Rome was running around, essentially. Um, so, and also there's like a lot of like little traditions that we find uh, in the various sagas where you've got people doing what is called house sitting, where they actually go to the grave of their ancestor and they sit and contemplate. And so on the grave, you take your offerings with you, you take your drink, take your food, yeah. you take your gifts, and you just sit on top of the mound and contemplate, meditate, commune, speak to. It's a lot of different processes that that probably looked like. A good resource for this, if you want to look into it, is um, H.R.E. Davidson's Road to Hell. Fantastic uh, book. She talks Very about academic. It's not a story. It's a dense, but it's one yeah. of our best resources that we have. It gives a good breakdown of the sagas as, as they relate to ancestor veneration as well. And there's one story that she tells of like someone uh, doing house sitting and then elves like approach and mm -hmm. steal shit and run off. Very interesting. Um, so, and another one that we see in uh, um, the sagas is another Heims Kringla reference. Favorites. Say what? Said one of your favorites. Is Hawk and the Good? Yeah. So, 
the saga of Hawkin the Good is told by Snorri where um, it's a Christian king trying to rule over pagan peoples and showing some of the challenges that he had. The saga starts off with some of the challenges that he had because he went over there. He was like, um, his father was King Harold Fairhair or Finehair and his brother was King Eric Bloodaxe. So he's got some very pagan, very peaceful man. Right. Blood axe. <laughs> Reasonable guy, known for that. Super chill. So uh, he, Hawkin the Good, is, is raised as the foster child of the King of England at the time and is raised a Christian. And uh, when both his father and his brother die, he's next in line. And so he goes over to Norway to rule as a Christian king. And his, he's going over this like, I'm going to go and convert everybody in Norway. This is going to be a good time. It's going to be an Should easy Should be easy. Time. No problem. Really simple. There yep. will be no political, socioeconomic strife over this concept. That's wrong. What? He, he tries to be like, all right, everybody, we're going to worship Jesus now. And all the farmers are like ready to do a, a general strike. Um, so... The people who produced the Vikings didn't like a bunch of outsiders coming and telling them what to do and how to worship. So strange. Right. So what happened was um, different, uh, they had to make some concessions where they had to recognize that the king was Christian, but then as the king, he still had to lead ritual as a Christian while not offending his pagan populace. So there were several like sort of agreements that were made where you have like uh, Hacken the Good making the symbol of a cross over a drink that he's about to drink and everybody <laughs> goes, did you just do the symbol of the cross? And he says, <laughs> well, the, the guy that's like trying to make everything peaceful goes, no, 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 Hacken the Good is making the sign of the hammer that's it's just the sign of the hammer but at this like big yule celebration that's described in this saga where he's trying everybody's trying to make concessions back and forth to each other um there's a description of a yule ritual where there's this big fire there's toast to the gods and the final toast is called the mini toast which is a toast to the ancestors again showing a little snapshot of ancestor veneration in the sagas uh so there's not a whole lot of historical examples, but we do find these little examples here and there. And I think Beethold sent you one as well that was really interesting. Oh, the that word. Yeah, I'm not gonna try and pronounce that. <laughs> it's Icelandic. So there's there's a there's a frustrating source that exists uh, called the I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation. I'm just gonna tell you the Flati Jarbrok, Jarbrok, uh, where it is. Uh, I've not found an English translation of it. Uh, but it contains a lot of incredible stories, like one of a Frere idol actually standing up and coming to life and dueling a Christian who was uh, smitten with the priestess of Frere. Um, it's a, like, there's a whole bunch of really awesome stories in it. There's also the uh, story of the Volsi yep. in there, uh, the which Volsi. I'm not going to go into detail about what that is. Nope. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, interesting. I have a video on my channel if you want to chase that one down. Um, but Plus one watch. Um, it's uh, it's a really interesting source, but in it it has also some other examples of ancestor veneration. Yep. Um, but why should we do ancestor veneration as heathens? What are we? What's so your, what are your thoughts on that? It's it comes down to the reasons that we honor the gods, the land whites, uh, and then of course the ancestors, and it has to do with. Uh, I view those three structures as very even pillars of heathenry. It's hard to build a good structure of heathen practice while not uh, paying enough attention to all three of those pillars. If you lose one, I feel like your practice would probably suffer just a little bit, especially as a recon. And so the reason ancestor veneration is so important is because, like we described earlier, were trying to emulate the good practices that they had in the past. We're trying to bring that forward into a modern practice. They are the ones who got us where we are today. 
even the bad ones, and we'll get into that in a minute, yeah, yeah. problematic ancestors, the ones that you probably wouldn't want to meet or speak to at all today, probably even some that have passed in your lifetime you don't feel that sorry about. Those are valid responses based on experiences that you've had or experiences that other family members may have had. But they did lead you to the point that you are in your life now. And that gift of getting here is worth at least a little bit of reverence. Yeah. I've got, I, I just, while you were talking, I actually started thinking of more historical examples. <laughs> Should I go back to that for a second or do? <laughs> How much time? We got 40 minutes. Okay, yeah. So another one is a story of Hafton the Black. He's this king in uh, Norway that is was incredibly plentiful. Uh, and like during the years where he was king, Norway was uh, very well off. And when he died, several places wanted to be the place where his burial was housed. Because where the burial was housed as a part of ancestor veneration was very important. The fight got so intense that his body was separated into four, I believe, and buried in different places because different places wanted some taste of his luck, basically. Yeah. Kings were seen as having a, a certain amount of luck. That luck would be passed down in certain ways, and one of those ways was to house the body uh, in a town. And uh, so ancestor veneration was not only individual but communal, and uh, even civilization-wide in some cases. So. Um, when people's luck are handed down, the Vikings had a very, in the, the Norse and also a lot of other Germanic cultures had a very interesting view of luck, where luck could be passed down through family, through close friendship, through uh, leadership. Kings were known to be able to lend luck to people that were on missions yep. for them. Yep. The um, king's so, blessing was so very important, especially if you're going like a long ways from home. So luck was transferable in the form of ancestor veneration, and that's another reason why it's important. Yep. Um, uh, talking about how like honoring where we came from, it is a good thing, it's not a shameful thing, spiritually or otherwise. Uh, examining the past is a good thing. Learning from our ancestors is a good thing, both the good things and the bad. Learning the mistakes that they made and making sure we don't make them ourselves is a form of ancestor veneration. It is correcting what took place in the past and making sure we move forward more positively, more, construct more constructively in the future is a form of ancestor veneration. So, let's see. And I guess that gets into... Well, you're talking, that up, it, yeah, it you're meets, talking about a little bit about problematic ancestors. Yeah, I think it meets the standard of bringing ancient practices into the present, which yeah. is the point of Reconstructionism. And I think that an, a, another point about Reconstructionism is bringing things... Uh, into the, but also thinking about what's reasonable to bring into the present right. as well. Because uh, you can use, there's some justifications for um, keeping tradition or something like that. You'll find people try and justify uh, a harmful view through saying, hey, I'm a reconstructionist, I'm preserving tradition. Right. But you can use those same justifications to say, well, what about human sacrifice? What about or slavery? For all them, slavery. You, know I mean? you have sects of heathens who are uh, currently <laughs> today in Georgia practicing thraldom based on what they view as good historical practices to bring forward. It's garbage. We shouldn't be doing that. Right. So, uh, and yeah, as a, as a result, you want to think about some of the practices that are going forward. We probably shouldn't be uh, cutting dead bodies in twain to try and preserve their luck uh, and burying them in different places and so on. But uh, it's just because that doesn't it doesn't really ring like a good solution today. So right. just because something was done in the past doesn't necessarily mean it's something they need to bring forward into the present. Um, so because we can look at the past and go, oh, that wasn't really a good solution. Let's learn from that uh, going forward. Um, so then we can get into problematic ancestors, yeah. right? So uh, this is kind of they learn from themselves, right? They didn't bring all of that forward themselves, right? Right. So you find evolving traditions in the past, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as a society, a big example of us learning as humanity generally has been 
most humans around today are of the position slavery bad, right? Right. That's something that we kind of learned fairly recently in human history. Uh, like when when you start looking at history and you think of the Civil War in America and that being in the 1800s and that was so long ago for a lot of us because none of us were alive at that point but historically when you start thinking in thousands of years and that was only like well even so if you want to really think about it think about how long Betty White was alive mm -hmm. that's, that's a good less point than two Betty Whites. that's a right. good point <laughs> that is a good point yeah um, so another really problematic aspect in history is even if we go back a thousand years the Vikings were probably pretty homophobic. They were probably pretty queerphobic. They probably weren't accepting broadly of trans people. Not, not absolutely, but definitely broadly in the culture. Right. There's you a have, common aspect of their culture. You have queer identities that exist within the societies, right? But right. then you also have them being ostracized. Right. And you have the story of Eric, of, uh, Eric Vladax um, killing one of his brothers who was practicing magic. Yep. Uh, Society so. had kind of protected some of the uh, some of the the priests in the area. Right. And then all of a sudden he decided. But no, the we're going to slaughter all the existence of the, of the stigma justifies the existence of people of that, the people that, that, that existed. Stigmatized. And they existed. They were able to come to positions of power. The society did accept them and tolerate I see, or whatever. I see you're like on. Do you want right, to go ahead? But yeah. then you also had Odin, who was a magician. Right. Oh, so, for sure. I, yes. I agree 100%. No, go ahead. Go, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm also a heathen, by the way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, there was this strange dichotomy where in some places it's accepted and in other places it's not. So. It seems to be accepted in certain contexts and then also not. Right. Right. So, right? so you and, can't say it was or wasn't depending on where you're looking at and when you're looking at it. Right. The, so, it seems to have been. And this this could be a whole panel in and of itself. E easily, yeah. uh, we're glossing over probably one of the more most controversial most controversial points of, in heathenry. Of, of heathenry, for yeah. sure. Um, and I'm of the position where you can have uh, a justification that Scotty is of a trans identity, and that uh, I think that there are probably several trans deities right. within oh, the yeah. pantheon. Because you see, like sometimes the gender of a deity moves back and forth across time, and you can justify a spirituality, a spiritual view on that 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 is transness among the gods very easily right mm -hmm. so a really uh, easy point too is loki is but easily when well, you're looking at the societies of the time you also see bigotry show up in those societies othering happened right right, right. so and it's important to acknowledge that that is an aspect of history it's also not an aspect of history that we need to replicate right. just because it existed in history does not mean we need to bring it into our modern context in the same way that they expressed mm -hmm. it correct we can improve upon the past yep so leave behind the bad, only move forward, progress forward. That's right. good. So acknowledging that that's an aspect of our ancestors is important. Yeah, realizing the problems, not burying your head. I coined a term ostrich heathenry, burying your head in the sand and trying to ignore the problems around you. That's not how we progress religiously, spiritually, or even as a society broadly. Um, another form of problematic ancestors would be probably most of us in here have Christian ancestors who if we tried to uh, have a conversation with them today it just wouldn't go very well I suspect that a lot of us would probably have several minor and major disagreements with our ancestors that lived in the 1800s right just think about all the positions that have changed that uh, well that maybe the Supreme Court thinks is a good justification for handing down law in their strange historical analysis sometimes. Anyway, not going to get there. But that there are disagreements that we have with people in the past that we've, as a society, kind of figured out. One thing that I did want to get around to talking about and I wasn't able to in the presentation at the time was the concept that our ancestors can change. Their minds can change. They can evolve on the path to the afterlife and while they are in the afterlife. We here on Earth, think about how different you think from five years ago or even ten years ago. Think how much the afterlife would impact them. The world impacts us now pretty much negatively. 
throughout our time here. So think about how freeing the mind will be able to evolve, not having the chains of worldly oppressions on them 24-7. Think about how great, free of pain, free of burden, it could only lead to a more positive mindset. So while, yes, they may not have been great people or they may have held hateful thoughts in the past, there is no reason to believe that they wouldn't change for the better in their time in the afterlife. And that's a very quick summary of uh, something that I think is very important to add to this conversation that I didn't get to while we were in that. One would be a bigot. Right. So that gets back into learning from the past. Ancestor veneration can also be a resource for being able to learn because one of the things that uh, I want to think, I want people to think about in terms of ancestors is looking at them within the context of their own time, right? So when you're looking at, say, the Vikings and you have like these aspects about them, or if you're looking at people in the 1800s and they have these aspects about them, yeah. you can also look at them in terms of how they existed within that period of time and recognize successes and failures, both within the context of which we're living today and within the context of when they lived at that point while you're engaging in that veneration, right? How many of you here are Southerners? Yeah, how, how many, many of you think that you have Confederate ancestors? Right, same. How many of those Confederate ancestors are probably racist as hell? <laughs> All right, yeah, again, context of the time, context of learning lessons, and also, celebrating their successes because if we look at if we just focus on the failures of the past we're going to go oh all of our ancestors were shit why yeah, are we and doing those and this veneration of them why are we engaging with that you you get kind of doomer about it a little bit and then you start abandoning the practice and then you realize oh i haven't done any ancestor veneration in a while because i've only focused on the negative aspects and everybody's shit and it's not worth it right so Start look, you can look at, again, context of time. You can start to see within that context, within that world, mm -hmm. our ancestors did do successful things. They, uh, and when you're looking at within heathenry, you're going back to Vikings generally, uh, but several different uh, Germanic societies. And there are incredible stories of people that you can, where their successes are recorded. Right. And uh, even going back into your own family history, there are probably several legends that uh, have been handed down through your family where there's these awesome stories of their successes of something that they uh, accomplished that was amazing. Um, so, you know, that's my grandfather was in World War II. There was, there's some stories that kind of came down from that. Um, but uh, on yeah. the subject of dealing with the doomerism of trying to figure out like how to navigate the problematic ancestor part that something you need to remember is personal practice is discernible to the individual you are not required to honor any who you do not wish to it's right. there's no like requirement if there is someone like i had said earlier if there's someone in the family that's just too hot to handle there's too much personal baggage wrapped up in that leave it alone walk away from it it's not important for you as the individual to deal with that. And it's not something that I would ever advocate for. Where are we at? Also, it is worth, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ones that he likes from now in the future, yeah. those people will be talking to our people who oh, we, will just say that people don't deserve health care. We talk that about that all the time. The norm. When people look back at us, we're going to so, be the problematic ancestors. Yes. Right. So and we that's, can't be all you know, precious about who we're talking to they're going to have to deal with our contemporaries. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how would we want the people in the future to look at us? Right. Are you going to want them to be like, oh, well, we were all problematic ancestors because we in engaged permissively in a system that had the, uh, the prison system that we have now, yeah. right? Or as you brought up, universal health care or the transphobia that we're experiencing in our society right now, right? So there's going to be points where people in the future are going to look back at us, we're going to be living in this time, and it might be that 
they don't know the particulars of what your beliefs were necessarily right right they're not going to know you personally but maybe some stories of your successes have come down you have to make sure that your impact is as hard as it can be in the right places for the right reasons right but at the same time those stories of your successes may not include a comprehensive list of what your opinions were on the problems of the day right yeah you know, i think that's a really good point because you know today how you feel in terms of how much you can do about all this fucking craziness in the world. Right, right. And that, in, and that Civil War soldier may have been in the same situation. Right. I agree. And so when we talked about the Confederate soldier that's your ancestor, probably racist as hell. Might have been an exception. Any of you know that? He might have hated what he was doing and just trying to provide for his family and conscripted into an army that he despised. There's no way to tell. Right. Because we don't know. They but we know generally like what the opinions were of the time. Of broadly So we know what the, the likely society. opinion was. Yeah, But likely. we don't know what the particular opinion yeah. was. Agreed. And your ancestors probably won't know particulars on yours. What's up? So just to, to kind of add on to that. Like or your descendants. Like, like, Go ahead. Sorry, I was correcting myself. I said ancestors and I said descendants. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, one way I like to think about this is that uh, the labor of those who came before us enabled us to be where we are. Somebody had to write all of these things down right. for us. We have really become very proficient at being efficient at translating knowledge between generations. All of that labor has led us here. People had to build those buildings right. that mm -hmm. we're sitting in right now so that we can talk to each other about these things. Right. They had to make the horse path that made up the highways right. that eventually got paved and so that we can be in an air-conditioned building yep. with running water and all of that. Yeah, engineers had to come up with those. Those efforts Somebody were probably made by people out. who probably weren't the best people ever. Maybe and we should start farming. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let me just go start farming. <laughs> We're benefiting from their successes. Right. Yeah. We're benefiting and, from their work. And we have to thank them somehow, I think. The most extreme example, I'm going to say this real quick, now I get to you, Jules. The most extreme example that I like to give is, uh, let's say you have like this great, great uncle who was just the most vile. Whatever you can imagine being bad, he did it. What if your great, great grandfather saw those mistakes and learned from him? and then passed those good family values of I saw great uncle Willie make all of those awful mistakes and I passed on to my son and on and on and on and then now here we are and we heard the tales of evil great uncle Willie doing bad things and so now that's why we don't do those bad things. That is a form of ancestor influence that became veneration of remembering the mistakes and correcting them. So I think that what we're essentially talking about is a problem of evil in relationship to ancestor veneration. Correct. And there's two, um, a theodicy in philosophy is a response to a problem of evil to try and justify what we're looking at. Yep. And the, there's two theodicies that I think are like the themes of what we're discussing here, which uh, one is justifying greater good, essentially, mm -hmm. that you look at the problems and you go, all right, well, what are the lessons that we learned? It's essentially a, a, a soul-building theodicy, right. somewhat, but converted to justifying uh, ancestor veneration. And the other one is looking at the holistic aspect. What are the things that came of it that we're benefiting from? There is a whole world of the past that has led up to where we are today, that there's aspects of uh, accomplishments of our ancestors that we're benefiting from now, which mm -hmm. is what we were talking about with Ray's point about uh, the labor of our ancestors. Extremely important view. That's a great way of looking at it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a fantastic summary there of like where kind of like the, the conflict in looking at ancestors, I mm -hmm. guess. So, but then also justifying hey, ancestor veneration, even in light of looking at these aspects, is still a good thing. Yep. So, uh, Jules, you had your hand up. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Run back to you real quick. Um, so, here's a question. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, 
ancestor veneration is the part of my practice that I get I struggle with the most. Right. Reasonable. Particularly because um, uh, my grandfather is an immigrant from Hungary, mm -hmm. and so on the other side of the family, there is no information about. Right. Mm. I don't know any of my ancestors past my grandparents who I knew when I met, and so. There is a distinct lack of information, a lack of family tales, family legends. There's nothing there to start to build off of. Right. Um, and so it, it's, what do you do when you're faced with like this crapshoot of just throwing a dart or <coughs> trying to find something? Yep. There's two, two answers to that. One of them, interestingly, comes from the Bible. Um, and then the, the next one is Our, adopting ancestors. <laughs> yep. yeah, that I think is also something that we should definitely cover. But the, the first one comes from the Bible, which is uh, Paul talking to uh, the Greeks and then utilizing their altar to an unknown god as saying, oh, look, it's mine. That's my god that you're talking about. You've already been worshiping him. Um, but to take the point from that story, the reason why that altar to an unknown god existed was because as polytheists, the Greeks were like, there are many gods. We don't necessarily know who all of them are. We don't know all the information about them. So we have this altar to those who are unknown. And we give alms and, and veneration and reciprocity to that altar. The same method can apply to ancestors. Yep. To Altar to the unknown ancestors. And reaching out in that way of like, I don't know your names. I don't know anything necessarily about you, but I'm still here. As a, as a result from you, I can give uh, reciprocity there. And uh, it's you don't necessarily have to know everything or even anything about your ancestors in order to engage in ancestor veneration. There's just the simple recognition of the generalized arguments that we've made here. Um, can I give you a, a really clear example yeah. of how to parallel this? Mm -hmm. Think about every ritual I've ever ended. God seen and unseen, known and unknown, heard right. and unheard. All of that list easily applied to your ancestors as well. Right. Um, so, I guess before we get into adopting ancestors, which is another yeah, let's wrap aspect. up our problematic ancestor part. Well, and we can move forward. Uh, if you want to wrap up that, I was getting, I was going to get into worship and, and what what that is in relation. But if you want to wrap up the problematic well, you you. Part, I think even you had a note here at the bottom how scientists may look at Aristotle or how botanists may look at Theophrastus. Some of their information is wrong. Right. They look at the things that they wrote down or posited uh, scientifically. Doesn't vibe with what we know today, of course. They were, of course, working within their own time. One of, one it of the, started uh, the process that we learned from, which is I think we could do easily with anybody in our own family. The work that they did may not be good now, but we can take the stuff that they did do well and learn from it and move forward with it. Early um, practitioners of medicine, one of, the, one of the parts of their sacred oaths was not to conduct surgery because think about a world in which there's no anesthetic and no antibiotics. Of course you wouldn't want to surgery open Surgery in the, in the ancient world would be a nightmare. But we don't need to have that as part of our oaths today because we've solved a lot of the problems that presented a reason for that oath there. Uh, so, you know, it's even though that was part of the oaths of our ancestors, we don't need to bring it in today. Um, and yeah, with Aristotle, Aristotle thought that things floated because they were curved on the bottom. You know, there's a lot of like things that uh, um, Galileo went through a list of Aristotle's physics and just proved a bunch of them wrong, starting with pendulums and then getting all the way into the structure of the, the solar system. So, um, you know, but we still have respect for Aristotle. We still have respect for Theophrastus yep. uh, as the father of, of botany, but um, we may not agree with everything that they wrote down. So we can venerate those ancestors, even if their contributions might have been a little off. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I guess worshiping ancestors, is that is that a word that you use for... Like, uh, veneration is usually the term that comes up because worship is so controversial. Veneration, I feel like, is... I definitely use that way more in all of my videos that I do, all of the scripts that I write. I tend to write the word veneration more frequently than the word worship. 
uh, if we really want to get down to the nitty gritty, they mean the exact same thing. It's giving honor and respect to working with. <laughs> Within the, the context of heathenry, there's not a huge difference because in ancestor veneration, it is a uh, alms reciprocity given directly to the ancestors in a relationship that is very much in keeping with polytheistic tradition. Yep. Are they gods? In some traditions, ancestors become gods. Yep. In some traditions, they don't. Some traditions, they're a separate thing. In heathenry, you have uh, an interesting in-between, um, uh, with especially with feminine ancestors, uh, with the Thysir. Yeah. Thysir, um, And you have full bloat rituals called the Thysir bloat, and it's giving honor to the Thysir. That we don't know a whole lot about. We really don't. But we just, it's mentioned a lot. But with the Thysir, you have... Uh, depictions of them as protectors um, through generations. Yeah, the and then, familial line. In addition to that, you also have the Hamingya, yeah. which is a, a, a luck entity, sort of goddess. It's Hamingya gets energy. used in a bunch of different ways. It's like as a well. close sentient energy that flows through. Well, there's a depiction of, of it as a giant woman moving yeah. around between mountains and stuff in, in the Boom Saga, but then there's a lot of times you see the word mm -hmm. Hamingya just used to reference luck generally, yeah. uh, but it's ancestral luck that gets thrown around, So, uh, but there is a personification of it that exists in one saga, um, and uh, you see it manifested as a feminine spirit mm -hmm. that is, has a lot to do with uh, our relationship with the ancestors, and that can get into adopting it, so in the context of Via Gloom, it was like either his father or his grandfather had just died and he saw the Hamingya being transferred between family members. I think it was being transferred to him. Yeah. Um, yeah he was receiving the Hamingya. Yeah. So, uh, and I believe it was a dream. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, um, that gets into adopting ancestors a bit because we're in heathenry. There's, I'm not directly related to Eric the Red, right? But maybe, it's, I think it's entirely reasonable to have spiritual ancestors, the people that are in the sagas that are part of our veneration, that are part of our modern access to the gods in these various stories. They have a place on our, in, our, uh, um, in our ancestor altars, you know, um, and in our ancestor practices, because they're the ones that are kind of showing us through their stories, little pictures of, of the past. And just like you would keep an altar to deities that you worship, whatever pantheon you're interested in or venerating or worshiping, you can also have altars to your ancestors, those who came before, those who you're interested in venerating. They could be historical figures like Ocean was talking about, or direct family people. Maybe the same altar or a different altar. A lot of people do different altars. But a lot of people do, do separate them. Sometimes you can mix them, you can mix and match. It's fun. It's because you have that freedom to do that. Yeah. Um, but I think that that leads into uh, within heathenry, there is the very obvious conversation that kind of pops up, especially with respect to ancestor veneration, which is the uh, concept of folkism, which is that the gods live in the blood. There's a uh, Stephen McNallan put forward a paper called Metagenetics, in which he described. Um, the uh, pseudoscientific concept of gods living in the DNA. Who's Stephen McNallan, Ocean? Uh, he's the founder of the AFA. I think he's the founder. Yeah, founder of the AFA. What is the AFA, Ocean? They are a focus racist heathen group. Now, so, uh, how does this racist heathen group, the, the SPLC, Southern, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center? Yeah, they're on. The, the, this hate group that came from this group? Yeah. Yeah. So the Poverty Law Center lists them as a hate group. Uh, the AFA stands for Asatru Folk Assembly. They are a white supremacist organization that seeks to. Somebody say folkism. Yeah. Right. Folkism is a form of spiritual racism. So what they hold basically is, and they use the justification of ancestor veneration, which we've talked about here, as saying, well, if you're not connected to these ancestors, you have no business venerating them and then uh, you're not welcome in the religion as a result. Um, you know, it, and you can pretty easily label their beliefs as white supremacist within that context. They will argue, argue with you back and forth and say, no, 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 we're ethnocentric. Yeah. 
in it's con the same thing. It's this, yeah, there is no difference. You're not uh, <coughs> within the cultural context. The difference is nil. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. Well, part of that is because they don't recognize exactly how far the the people traveled and brought people back with them and hosted. The There's people. a lot of ahistorical beliefs that they use in order to hold their position, and it extends also to pseudoscience with respect to metagenetics. The, if you want as, to, there's also, oh, go ahead, Jen. Yeah. If you want to go to a white supremacy position, you know what Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There's been, there's been like, uh, the, people have done that on TV, right? And they find yeah, out. Yeah, they find yeah. out and stuff. But the concept of they travel and meet other people and they were fine with it, there's also the opposite concept of we have burial the, loads. the farmer who was born on the farm never traveled more than 10 to 20 miles away from the farm, only ran into maybe 20 to 50 separate individuals in their entire life, died on that same farm, and never met someone who didn't look like them. So they didn't have the, they didn't have the perspective to know that someone looked other than themselves to even form an opinion based on hate. And both so of these things can be true. Both of those things are true, yeah. and that those examples have happened throughout history. So it's very dumb to be a folkist. Super stupid. Do not do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about um, adopting ancestors briefly, and we're going to just, they'll kick us out. So um, with adopting, you, you talked about Eric the Red. Yeah. Uh, I have a very similar situation with Harold Bluetooth. Uh, I venerate Harold Bluetooth as an ancestor. I don't know if I'm related to him. I really don't care if I am or not. It's not something that I'm interested in trying to track down. Uh, it wouldn't matter one way or the other to me. The aspect of him um, trying to unite people together, that's something that I heavily believe in, uniting the right people together, people who are not bigots, not racists, finding people who can get along, uniting them together so that we can effectively fight against the bad of the world. I think that that's a good thing, and that's something that I bring into my practice and my family veneration. Another person that gets commonly brought up in adopting ancestors might be uh, Odd the Deep Minded. She was one of the first uh, colonists to Iceland um, and uh, brought a big ship, huge family, claimed a whole bunch of land, divvied it up uh, for her family, um, uh, wound up arranging relationships for everybody in her family, and then uh, established a great legacy for herself. Um, before she uh, hosted a wedding, um, gave all of her property to uh, the groom and bride, and then went upstairs and finished, like, she died, Yeah, you know? So uh, there's there's a lot of, like, little stories. Yeah, the Icelandic sagas, sagas like are that. full of examples right. of, uh, of people adopting outside of the family line to venerate them as if they were family. There's That's, no difference. There's also a lot of options for uh, ancestors to adopt spiritually for the stories that you might find to be like, that's an example I want to follow. Right. Right. Um, so Eric the Red, I don't know about example to follow. I think it's very, <laughs> but uh, again, um, or uh, Freya Eric's or Freya Eric's daughter, mm -hmm. who was um, uh, the first woman to uh, go across the Atlantic. Um, I think that if you look at the sagas, she kind of counts as the first admiral because she was in charge of two ships. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, and yeah, like, so there's a lot of like little areas in there, like people that you can look to for inspiration and say, this person belongs on my ancestral altar. Um, and what are some of the ways that you can utilize? And also, and there's, for real quick, as far as like the, the folkism crap, we don't know if these people were related to us. And with folkists, and all of their crap about DNA and metagenetics, they also don't care if you were fucking related to these people. So they're, it's inconsistent over there too. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, they're, even with their pseudoscience and crap and the little world that they've built and justification for that, they still can't manage to retain consistency, uh, even in their bigotry, which is common of bigots, but that's yeah. fine. So as a Southerner, what is one of the best ways to get together and honor your ancestors? Big meals. Cook a big family meal. Cook a big family meal. Use family recipes that have been passed down through the line. My lovely wife uh, has several recipes that are hundreds of years old at this point. They've just been written down. They have 
old pen scratched handwriting that's barely legible now and we're having to transcribe those recipes so that they'll be legible for the future. We're trying to digitize them, make sure that they get to preserve through history. And using the exact same methods, cooking steps to make the meal that they would have eaten 100 or 200 years ago is one of the best ways, the easy ways that you can do that. And it's a lot of fun too, because we all love to eat. Making a, uh, while you're doing that huge meal, festival, whatever, even if it's just your family at home or something like that, having an extra plate out for the ancestors. Uh, one thing that we talked about as far as doing for our gatherings would be like that everybody- having one plate and yeah, go yeah. ahead. So everybody gets their meal and then everybody takes a bite from their plate and puts it on the ancestral plate. So you, you and then there's fix your plate the and then spoon one full on, because we usually have, you know, 20 or 30 people together and so, having 20 or 30 spoonfuls, it would be a hodgepodge mess, yes, but each of us have contributed to this plate and then as a group, set the plate outside for the ancestors and then everybody's ancestors can come and sit and eat just as we come and sit and eat together as a group. Or you can say, uh, set the, the um, plate, at the, if you have a communal table of some kind, Correct. a plate sit, the plate sits at the table with an empty chair. Yeah. And uh, eventually that the is plate the will ancestral make it chair. And yeah. then eventually the plate makes it outside. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, and that's like ideal situation. There's a number of ways to adapt that for your particular environment. Like say that you live in an apartment or something like that. The plate may not be able to make it outside, but there's other ways of disposing that in a yeah. way that you maybe gets to the land rights. Maybe you take, maybe you take a trip out somewhere or something yeah. like that. Or, or even honestly, in the trash. It can just end up in the trash can because where does the yeah. trash go? It goes outside, and they aren't all that fun to be around. They can still tell some of those best stories, and. That is an amazing way to both preserve history and honor those that came before because they might be 80 or 90 years old and when they were a child, they were told stories by someone who is 80 or 90 years old. Just like you were talking about two Betty Whites back, you can do that by listening to a story. You can hear a story that took place 150 years ago, it's easily. It's difficult these days though because people, people scatter. They do mm -hmm. scatter, yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, in the South, though, you know, people tend to it's stay. It's a little bit easier to get everybody here. together during Christmas or Thanksgiving. But the way to get around that is you, you, you designate someone a special historian. I agree, 100%. Right. And but they write it down or they tape it. Yes. She's because our family historian. I, I've known so many what, stories that were told mm -hmm. at Thanksgiving that as a child that at one point in my life I went, shit, I wasn't alive. Right. But it, it seemed like I was there because I'd heard it so many so times. So many times, yeah. It, yeah. It, it was part of my DNA. Yeah. It was like, I can tell that story because mm -hmm. I was there. No, no, I was The story there. lives in your bones. You can yeah. feel it. Absolutely. Uh, but I find it an act of service to find the graves that are not taken. That's what she does. She'll go to the graveyard and find graves that have nothing to do with us and she'll clean them up, clear the leaves off of them, make sure that they might be like washed off a little bit. There's some that have sunken down and they just become holes and then leaves fill in and it just looks like a normal pile of leaves. It's like, no, their family stopped caring about them and so that's what she does is she tries to take care of them and make sure that they're remembered. Grandparents but pictures pictures is a good one because that's something that you can do to honor your ancestors we were talking about ancestor altars earlier is you can have pictures they can be faded they can be old they can be recent you can take them and set them on your altar as a way to always remember them as you're walking by just take a moment give a thought and say you know thank you for at least getting me here yeah. and I think that um, when getting into, I guess, the, the storytelling mm -hmm. aspect, um, like telling stories at groups, you can have, like, when you have, like, heathen gatherings, I think, and you get into a, uh, you know, an ancestor <coughs> celebration of some kind, one of the things can be, you can tell stories of your of, uh, family stories, or you can tell stories of ancient ancestors that inspire you as well, yeah. and keep those ancient ancestors alive, spiritual ancestors, adopted ancestors, and say, well, I have as my adopted ancestor this person. Let me tell you that story and why it inspires me. And that's something that can be really good, uh, like aspect of the mini toast that's in 
uh, the story of exactly. Hawthorne the Good. You know, it's like exactly. we're toasting to the ancestors, we're telling stories around. Some people have family stories, some people have adopted ancestors, and you can tell those stories. Yes. Anyway, uh, thank you everybody for coming out for this one. This is a good, I think this is a good panel. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> It's like, oh, one person like it. <laughs> and thank you for your work on keeping heathenry. Oh, thank you very much.